yeah, there it goes. Okay, guys, so <laughs> first question is, what do you know about the Internet of Things? Did you ever heard about this? Yeah, I think so, because um, in general, if you refer like a couple of years ago, let's say 2016, 2015, it was one of the most hot words in the business. Uh, nowadays, it's AI, which actually goes quite close to Internet of Things. But that days, it was mostly Internet of Things and big data, which are also close one to another. Uh, at the moment, uh, the market is still very, very, very demanding on the devices, on the software, on uh, systems, on the IoT systems. I was actually expecting it to somehow slow down a little, but it didn't. It even exceeded. There are many reasons to that, and I would say that perhaps one of the most important reasons is that uh, the new generation, it became a sort of the geeks on technology. So you easily accept something that is monitoring your daily life, right? Like, for example, a smartwatch. You monitor your health, and actually, you are not very thrilled about that someone may <laughs> even reuse this data later for some other purposes, right? Which is regarding the IoT security we will discuss briefly. Uh, and you can have it more on the master scores on informatics. But here we'll just start a couple of um, uh, IoT security things. But anyway, you accept that you are being monitored by the video cameras. They are everywhere. They are on the street. They are in the public communication. They are in the shops and sometimes even at home, right? You get it for the security purposes just to check. You may use, for example, a smart lock right at your door just to forget bring the key with you, just rather to use your fingerprint to open the door or whatever else is necessary, like a code or anything else. So uh, the technology still develops. And let's try to define first an Internet of Things in the context of this modern technology and the data processing. Then we'll go through the overview of the enabling technologies standing behind the IoT, how it happened that it developed, right, and was still growing. Uh, and then we will switch into the mobility, which is, um, I would say, perhaps the most important part of the Internet of Things. And then we'll go for some examples, right, of the application. So this is the plan for the next uh, hour and, uh, and a half. So first of all, <coughs> if we think about the IoT ecosystem, it's all about processing the data. We start from the perception layer. Uh, perception is just a name, but it also makes an actuation to the world. So, for example, you can think about like measuring a temperature or checking either it rains or not, and then closing the door or the window, just not to let, let the rain come inside the building. This is the most left part here. And um, it is done using some sensors and the actuators. Those sensors and the actuators, they are like small electronic components, usually quite dummy. They measure some physical phenomena. They provide it with some standard embedded systems protocol that we'll also talk about. But finally, every IoT device has a microcontroller on board. And also, which differs Internet of Things and the embedded systems is that in the IoT, it is obligatory to have two things first networking capability. It needs to be able to communicate wirelessly mostly. Sometimes wired way, but mostly wirelessly. And it has a unique ID. That's one of the standing technologies behind the IoT. I will explain it later, right? Just some examples. Okay, what happens next? <laughs> this layer is sometimes referenced as an edge. So, the next thing is that we need to get use of this data locally. What is the matter is, for example, when you have a temperature monitoring system in the building, like for example this one, it just measures the temperature, the sensors. But we need, if you need to get use of this information, 
you need, for example, to tag these measurements with current time and the date. And note, IoT devices don't necessarily have a real-time clock because they don't have to. They just measure a value. They send an information to FOC-class devices that are located somewhere here. And those devices process this information. For example, aggregating them. Why? Because the network doesn't like small packets. Right? Internet doesn't like small packets. Ah, you know it. And the computers in general do not like small packets, right? They like like a big chunks of data. So, uh, and also because if you want to have a snapshot of the information in the big building, let's say this one, and you have, for example, hundred thousand of sensors, they should measure the data in the same moment of time just to find out the correlations, right? So your network in general is doing nothing or is bloated. Right? So that means that there need to be some sort of layer that's aggregating this data. I don't know, either zipping or making it more compact, making it into bigger frames, and forwarding it over the local network or the internet to the cloud. Uh, whatever you may think about this cloud here to the right, I mean, to me, the cloud is not only the clouds, as you know, for example, Google or Microsoft or IBM Watson, which is IoT, or any other like an Amazon, right? But they are also private services, like your own QNAP at home, which set up the database and the IoT stack. So it can be personal, not necessarily public cloud, right? And obviously, the connection here depends on how long the data needs to travel to the destination. So it can be local network or a global network, right? Uh, finally, you get some knowledge to the right, which means that <laughs> you need to get use of this information that was sent from the sensors. Um, in practice, it means that uh, there is used to be a sort of the database. Here's where the big data comes. Because if you consider how many measurements you have and you do it over the time, it's like a huge time series, both in the amount of data for a single record and also over the time. Because later on, you can get use of like a time-related data and lies a time time uh, um, uh, time-related data, time-related time chains of information, and get some knowledge. For example, make an AI here and learn user patterns. You can learn every day how people come to this room. You can check how many people in average are there. And you can, for example, start in advance heating or air conditioning. Once knowing how many persons are there, you know how much heating or air conditioning you will need. So perhaps you can predict, for example, the power consumption. This is how you can get use of the data here. And obviously, this information goes backwards from the cloud, through the local or internet, through the edge, and the fo fog first, and then edge, right? Fog is to the right, edge is to the left. Uh, then goes to the embedded systems, and perhaps there's an actuator. For example, a servo motor that is closing the window, or a servo motor that's opening the valve on heating, right? Or an, let's say, infrared emitter that starts air conditioning unit. Hmm? So that's an actuator, right? Something that does an action to the environment. Measure, process data, get use of it, and act. This is how the IoT ecosystem works. Okay, so <laughs> what is this IoT done, right? Um, actually, as you see, it's quite hard to say. There's no single definition. Um, as far as I was reading in some 2014, when we were starting our first grant on the Internet of Things, I can tell that there was a European handbook on what is the Internet of Things about 200 pages. Actually saying not much about what is this, just describing and giving the scenarios. But I would say that on the technological level, Internet of Things is like an, uh, by the end of devices, those that you interact with. It's like an embedded system, but with the network capability. Wireless, mostly wireless, and very energy efficient. What is the most important in the IoT is that on every stage of data processing, 
it should be you should be able to target uniquely an identity, which means that, for example, every single device, it should have a unique ID. Can you give me an examples of the unique IDs that you know? Yes, but I would rather say, uh, because we have this network address class translation, uh, IP address can represent a bunch of the devices standing behind NAT, right? So uh, perhaps a MAC address is better, right? Because MAC address theoretically is considered to be uh, unique worldwide, right? So it's one of, one of the possibilities. Uh, it is all about the data processing. And a must is there is a mesh to mesh communication model. So all the stack that I was presenting to you, it means that the data is being sent from one layer to another layer automated way. Humans are not interacting in that. I mean, human can interact by the end node, right? For example, switch on the light. But what happens next is automated. So there is no guy that is like and taking the data from one monitor and putting this to another one, right? It doesn't exist here in this communication. Obviously, in this communication model that we talk about here, we definitely want to, in the future, of course, to let it become a sort of the semantic communication. And by the semantic communication, I mean like a natural language. Nowadays, there are synthetic protocols like an um, IP, TCP, UDP, HTTP, but there is a bunch of IoT special protocols that we'll talk about because uh, either you know or not, but those devices here, they are very resource constrained. Majority of them is resource constrained as much they cannot handle regular IP stack that you know from your personal computers or mobile phones. They're not powerful enough, they don't have RAM enough, they don't have CPU enough just to handle it, right? So we need a different protocols. And there are special IoT protocols designed that are uh, very compact, uh, memory and energy efficient. We'll talk about this a little bit later. So here is an example why, for example, an EAN code, a barcode that you know from the products, is not an example of the Internet of Things, but RFID is. Imagine you come to the shop. <laughs> you know there are like a protection stickers, right? So we buy, for example, a jacket, and it has this protection sticker. The sticker goes through the cash desk. When you pay, the sticker is unlocked. So the gates, they know that they won't ring when you pass with this particular ID. But there are many jackets. And all the jackets, they have the same EN. If you use an EN for IoT identification, then once someone buys a jacket, all are gone, right? If you use RFID, like here to the left, it means that this particular jacket is being released from monitoring and security, but the others do not. So this is the difference, right? EN code represents a class of a products, devices. Why RFID represents a particular single unit. So this is a requirement of the Internet of Things. Now, let's quickly go through the technologies that they stand behind uh, the Internet of Things. First of all, uh, I would even say that those prices are too high because they drop every couple of months. Anyway, if you consider like an end node device, <laughs> there's a number of the microcontrollers that you can buy with the price of one or two dollars, even with the wireless communication capability. I'm talking here, for example, about this Espressives O1, which you can find mostly in the smart bulbs. Majority of the smart bulbs inside, those that you can program right remotely, red, green, blue, flashing or whatever, they are equipped with one of the Espressive chips. Either it's uh, ESP8266 in this O1 version, it's like a very small one, or it's uh, Descendant 85, I cannot recall the name right now. But still, uh, those are very small devices, quite powerful. So they integrate everything you need inside the chip. It's uh, a microcontroller composed of the CPU, 
sometimes floating point, this one not in particular, but there are many microcontrollers in the IoT that they do have a floating point unit, right? So you can make this uh, floating point uh, calculations uh, um, hardware way and not software way. Uh, they also integrate RAM inside, but the RAM is not big. RAM is something like a home computers from early 1970s or 80s, right? Something like a 16 kilobyte, 64 kilobyte. Uh, the powerful devices can have something like a 300 kilobytes, right? Up to, let's say, megabyte, but not more. A flash memory, sometimes it's external, sometimes it's integrated, depends on the chip, uh, but still, there are many, sorry, I have a throat ache, so <laughs> a little, because the spring is gone, so it's quite easy to get cold. Anyway, uh, the typical flash is about, like say, one, two, f four, eight uh, megabytes. So you see, it's a very constrained world, right? If you consider like an HTTP stack, it's a hundred of kilobytes in RAM and some megabyte in storage, then it's overgone, right? And where is the place for the algorithm? Okay, good. What is uh, Important part is that uh, there is a networking capability. Some um, microcontrollers that get it to IoT, they have it built in. It can be either Wi-Fi, which is, let's say, not very energy efficient, and Bluetooth, and Bluetooth low energy, quite common. But there's a dedicated ISO OC stack for IoT, which is called A02.15.4. AO211 is Wi-Fi, right? AO215.4 is special for IoT. And it's like a protocol, maybe you heard about it, it's called Zigbee. Open thread or thread, actually. Did you hear about this? The Zigbee is something that comes like from the manufacturers of the uh, very early uh, home IoT appliances, like, for example, automated windows, doors, and so on, right? We'll talk about this on the lecture regarding the networking. So here is just an information. There's a special separate standards for the IoT protocols. And they are very efficient. And moreover, they're optimized towards energy efficiency. Uh, just uh, one uh, quick example regarding uh, GSM communication. We'll talk about this also on the... Uh, on the, oh, let, let, let me postpone it when we come to the mobility, because that's, that's important. Okay, so let's focus on the others here. Like, uh, there's a wide connectivity capabilities regarding uh, connecting sensors and actuators. Most of the microcontrollers, they provide out of the box either hardware or software implementation of at least serial port that we know from the computers, SPI, I square C, sometimes it's also CAN. CAN is very popular in cars, right? It's not necessarily very in, in uh, industry. So it's industrial IoT. Uh, usually USB, sometimes through the external chip, sometimes it's integrated in the microcontroller. Some flash storage, usually over SPI externally, they can extend your flash, or some microcontrollers do not have a flash memory. You need to add another chip outside. And all those devices, if you consider how big are they, I would say as big as the size of a nail. Sometimes bigger if you have a power unit, but the chip itself is like a half by half centimeter. Oh, you have a raspberry there, right? So. Yeah. And so this chip inside, right? Because the development, yeah, but hold on, it's development board. So it has, it's big because it has connectivity, right? So the chip itself is this one in the middle, right? So if you make like a dedicated solution, perhaps you don't need to have this universal connectors. So it's much more compact. And what is the power consumption is essential here? Look, uh, we'll talk about the enrollment challenge soon, but uh, let me give you an example. Imagine, for example, this famous bridge in San Francisco. You know that the San Francisco and the nearby area is very fragile to earthquakes. 
So you need to put some accelerometers that will check either the bridge construction is okay, right? They need to check either it's there's some tensions, right? When there's a movement of the of the soil of the earth. So for that reason, uh, you need to put the sensors perhaps on the top of the pillars or somewhere there, right? Quite similar situation in in Iceland. Iceland is instantly monitoring its volcano activity. We had an example recently, right? It happened that they found out something is going wrong because there was a bulge. So they are monitoring the surface. They can do it via satellites, but they mostly do it via some GPS-based altitude or pressure-based altitude uh, checking, right? And scanning it all the time. And there's a sensor network. The deal is that those are all remote destinations. For this destination, <laughs> you need to make a battery operating device because there is no power around here. And I bet that there is no guys that want to go there every second day and recharge this device like you do with your mobile phones, right? So, indeed, they need to work on the very low power consumption. I stated here milliampere, but in fact, it may happen even it's a micro or nano amperes in a sleep mode. So this is another future of many of uh, IoT microcontrollers. They are able to put themselves into the sort of the sleep modes or hibernation modes that they actually do not operate. They are in semi-activity, but they still can get ready and wake up when needed send the critical information and then fall asleep. And this kind of the devices can take like a single, you know, this lithium ion cell 18650, and it can operate on that for over a year or even more without recharging, right? So it's really energy efficient, right? Okay, the price, you say how much was that? 20 zloty, it's five dollars, right? Yeah, something like that. Oh. Oh. Beside these end node devices, there are FOB class devices. Uh, they are mostly mm, socket wall powered, or eventually they are powered with some battery and green energy resources like, for example, a solar panel with a backup battery in case there is no sun, uh, and so on. What I mean here is a quite a good example is Raspberry Pi, but not this one that you had it because it's uh, Raspberry Pi Nano, right? Okay. Yeah, Pico, okay, so this is the end node microcontroller class. But I'm talking about these bigger Raspberry Pis <laughs> that are uh, having a USB ports, uh, that are having an Ethernet port, uh, they have multi-core a CPU on board, and obviously they have much more um, uh, RAM and storage. You can even find the versions that have 16 gigabyte of RAM, uh, not directly from the Raspberry Pi, but the clones. Chinese clones are having that. The biggest Raspberry Pi at the moment, five, is having like an eight gigabyte of, of RAM. Actually, this is the class of, I would say, computers that their performance is comparable to some devices in the 90, late 1990s or beginning of the uh, 21st century. Uh, those devices can act like a desktop computers. Maybe not super efficient, but you can play the video. They claim even you can connect two 4K displays, right? To this latest one. Uh, so obviously they can work like an entertainment system. But from our point of view, they mostly act as gateways and rotors. Why? Because on one hand, they do have a network on board, which is wired, and on the other hand, they are equipped with wireless capabilities. So they are naturally access point, routers, gateways. Moreover, they're still easily extendable with dedicated hardware because opposite to PC computers and the laptops, they do have a GPIO, so you can use those embedded system protocols here. You can still connect the sensors, but mostly you will connect some, they call it shield, like an extra board, that will perhaps have some IoT protocol, like this 802.15.4, right, interface. This is how you create a, for example, 
thread gateway that converts this AO to 15.4 into the internet, right? So into the Ethernet. <laughs> so, indeed, they have a rich user interface capabilities because majority of them are having an integrated GPU, graphic processor unit, not only a CPU. Uh, so it can deal with uh, video streams. Now, depending on what class of the device we are talking about, there are really handy devices like, for example, NVIDIA Jetson series that can handle easily many video streams in parallel and processes data. Moreover, uh, Jetson, which is a little bit bigger than the Raspberry Pi, but still has the same GPIO, for example, so we can use the same. Yeah. Uh, image processing. Yeah, yeah, it is image processing, but in general, NVIDIA Jetson and uh, not necessarily Nano, but also some others like this Xavier, AVX, and, and so on. They are uh, devices dedicated for, I would say, the origin is from robotics, indeed, because they were for processing the data on the drones, on the ground vehicles. And uh, this is the first choice when we experiment with these autonomous systems. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what they use right now, but I know when the Tesla was starting their project, we were using NVIDIA on board, right, just to make this autonomous system. Right now, perhaps they have their own hardware, I guess, but that days it was uh, in the beginning. Okay, obviously, uh, the power consumption is a little bit bigger. And what's important to mention here is that those devices are able to do AI. Maybe not training of the model, but definitely can get use of the model, which is not so easy in the aforementioned end node devices because of the constraint on RAM, CPU and energy. Here, those devices they consume are somewhere in between 5 and 50 Watt, then 50 Watt, so powering voltage is really 5 or 12 volts. Uh, price, well, price is naturally bigger, right, because you have like a fully functional computer. I mean, you need to connect peripherals, but uh, still you can work like a fully functional computer. Uh, and There do exist some devices like they're Intel-based. This X, X86, that's uh, Intel NUC, they call it Nuke, or in general, Intel Edison, yeah, Intel I Atom, it's uh, X86, so the Windows w w goes there. But to be honest, uh, majority of those devices are operating on the Linux operating system. And this is the next difference between Edge class and the Fog class. In the Edge class, you mostly craft a firmware yourself. If there is an operating system, it's embedded into your firmware on the development level, like on the programming level. The most common operating system for end node devices is RTOS, real time operating system. It's cross platform. Here, for those devices, if you run some logic, it is built on the top of the operating system that is running under the hood all the time. So this is different, right? You don't, I mean, you could, but actually you don't in majority of the solutions. You can still craft a firmware for Raspberry Pi, it's up to you, but it's very complex. So no one is doing that. We rather install a Ubuntu, Raspbian, which is the Debian clone or any other operating system. Quite common is Android here as well, uh, in particular with the Chinese clones. It mostly comes with the flash of, uh, um, uh, Android, yeah, there. Uh, and Android uh, is installed because, <laughs> it's quite funny, because of the GPU capability, which is not a case of open source uh, Linux. So um, don't be surprised that uh, if a clone of the Raspberry Pi, I mean, Raspberry Pi has a support. Uh, for, for the GPU processing, but uh, NVIDIA as well. But if you go with this Orange Pi, Banana Pi, and so on, you will have a GPU acceleration only under the Android, but you won't have it under the Linux because of some uh, licensing limitations, so it's usually not included. Maybe it is solved now, but like a couple of years ago, it was a serious problem. So if you are processing like an encoding video, decoding video, 
in the stream, you were on the CPU, and it was much, much more slower, unfortunately. Okay, uh, next facts. First, internet. Wireless and the wired networks nowadays, they are omnipresent. They're everywhere. Your mobile phone is perhaps connected right now at least to GSM and the Wi-Fi, right? Two of them. Uh, the cost of the data transfer has dropped significantly. And there are prepaid plans that give you virtually unlimited uh, amount of data you can transfer, right? I mean, maybe it's not unlimited, but in terms of the IoT, it's unlimited. Why? Sending a temperature once an hour <laughs> won't use a gigabyte in the month. It will use a megabyte in the month, right? <laughs> so it's uh, not so uh, problematic. Okay. Here I stated also for the SMS messages. SMS is a very good example of the UDP. <coughs> but there is one thing that perhaps I will also refer again on this networking, that you need to be aware of using GSM in the IoT and end node devices. It would become a natural because it is a very widespread network. Um, even in some uh, remote destinations in uh, where there was no infrastructure before, you can access an, uh, GSM now. Obviously, there is like a blind spot still, but in majority, 90% of the country is covered, 97% is covered with at least one network. In the other countries, in developing countries, it may be less, but it's still more available than, for example, Wi-Fi or some other dedicated services. But there is a problem. Regardless of how much you pay, you still need to have a contract per device. eSIM may solve a little, but this technology is not yet widely accepted. So currently, if you shape your IoT device that is using uh, GSM communication, you need to use a regular SIM card just to put it in. So we need to buy it. And here we face another time enrollment challenge. You cannot just drop. You need to put a SIM card to every single one, register it, right? It's problematic. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Okay. Some change in the fifth generation of the network. Something has changed. Uh, what I mean, something. Uh, 5G was supposed to have an IoT dedicated services that should ease it. So, for example, the IoT devices may not necessarily need to use a SIM card, but some other kind of the provisioning and authorization. Unfortunately, uh, as far as I can observe how the market is going, it is that the 4G and the 5G, they mostly differ by the transfer rate. But there are no dedicated services, or at least they are not so widespread and popular yet. Perhaps that will change over the time. What is the serious problem with currently existing majority of the devices is Let me ask you, did you ever experience that your mobile phone is draining much faster in a remote destination, like in the forest or the desert? Why? It's not draining as fast as when it's at home. It doesn't drain battery as fast as when you are here in the city. Okay. Okay, okay. This is this is true what you say, but uh, actually I was thinking about something else. We need to base on how your cellular phones work. Uh, whatever you may know is that they contact more than one BTS, more than one tower, tower at the moment. Why? Because um, you know the capacity of the single cell is limited. So in case uh, you are traveling, or uh, in case there isn't like an overhelm of people in one cell, they will drop some mobile phones to another cell, right? They will switch automatically. 
it, it happens even if you talk, right, during the call. You may not notice that or you may notice just some, you know, glitch and then, then it goes. So for that reason, your mobile phone is a very friendly animal. It wants to talk to more than one tower. It knows that it's supposed to do that, right? It needs to attract many towers. Now, what is the problem in the remote destination is that there's usually just one tower with a low range, right, with a low signal level. So your mobile phone is getting scared. It comes and sees, okay, I can contact one tower, but I need at least two more, right? So I said, hello, is there anyone? Shouting loud means using a full transmission power which drains the battery, but there is no answer because there are no other towers in the range in the, the most in the remote destination, or there's maybe two, but it's in three or four. This is why it drains the battery. And this is also what happens in case of the IoT devices. They are the same models that are in the, let's say, early mobile phones in like um, the year 2000, right? Or maybe beginning of 2010, you can buy at the, mo uh, at the market at the moment. They usually contact at most with the 3G, eventually with the 4G, but for the IoT, you don't need to have a high bandwidth. So this is okay, right? Even 2G is okay. You just need to send a small message over GPRS, right? So that works or over edge in the 3G. So that's quite enough to send, for example, a status or a temperature or whatever it is, and get a message back, just please close the door, right? And activator, close the door. But the communication is a problem. Principles of the communication in the GSM are the problems here, okay? So this is what really makes this problematic. Okay, uh, the cities are also covered with a grid and mesh networks. Um, I mean here that Perhaps you found out that uh, if you um, sign a contract uh, with the UPC or Orange or whatever else, your access point is usually hosting another access point for public access. Not always, but sometimes, right? So they're sort of the public networks, so then you pay like a lump sum and you can use it uh, city or countrywide, and then you connect to the Wi-Fi instead of draining your uh, mobile account just to use uh, GSM, but you need to look for that one. So it works mostly in the bigger um, uh, bigger cities. And municipality-operated networks, like in Wi-Fi networks in the cities, are also quite widespread, and you can just try to get used them to use an uh, IoT devices. But the problem is they are public, and they are not very reliable, because you never know when the network goes down, right, for some reason. For example, they stop the service, and you are gone suddenly. So. Uh, connecting to such kind of the infrastructure, you need to ensure either it's not mission critical or and you accept the fact that it may, may be gone. Or, on the other hand, you are sure that the service is going to be available, right? And the SLA is fine. And interesting is LoRaWAN. Okay. This is a low range wide area network that actually we even use here in this building. Uh, it's very slow protocol. It will let you send the data with some, oh, I would say, 250 bytes per second. Not much. But this is enough to send a packet saying, for example, I'm alive. I'm sending the temperature. It's really enough. Or, for example, send the coordinates from time to time for tracking. LoRaWAN has a great future. It doesn't need a very high uh, energy to operate. And also, on the other hand, parallelly, the range of the single access point of the LoRa is even up to 30 kilometers, if it is, for example, on the top of the building. And it could it be, but in the, in, the, in the short range, right? Like if you have a dog or cat, you can just give it a try. And on the other hand, those end node devices are very energy efficient there because there are classes of the devices. We'll talk about this later on the networking because this is perhaps one of the smartest findings in the Internet of Things developed in terms of the protocols. I like it very much, so we'll talk about this later. Okay, now let's go to the logical level. Ha! And here you face a serious problem. You know the IP, right? Your mobile is having an IP, your laptop is having an IP right now. Either it's public or private. That's another story. So let's go. What stands behind the IP? IPv4 is 32-bit. 
2 to the power of 32 is okay it's uh, close to four and a half billion the days that ipv4 was developed it looked at huge it looked at bold it was wow but the problem is that In 2021, there is 22.5 billion IoT devices on the IoT in the world. By 2025, according to this Business Insider projection, it's 35 billion. And we also have close to 9 billion people where almost everyone has a laptop and a mobile phone and perhaps some other devices. And there are computers here. And there are computers here companies and there's a computer waiting at your home and there is a router and there is a network area storage that you have and there is a smart tv gosh and the smartwatch gosh it's bold it's far beyond that one and we are still on the ipv4 how is it possible there are more people than the ipv4 addresses now so how is it possible yeah we use network address translation okay the deal is as follows the idea is let's use one public ip address and hide the devices behind it, a bunch of them, more than one. They will naturally be able to get routed outside. But this is a problem with the IoT. What did we say in the very beginning? An IoT device needs to be uniquely identifiable. If you have a NAT, you don't know what's behind this network. You can only face the router. And you don't identify the devices that stand behind this network, right, uniquely. It's not suitable for IoT at all. So. Uh, at some moment of time, people invented IPv6. IPv6 uses 128-bit addressing, which gives you this number. I'm not sure what is the name of such a long number, but anyway, looks good, right? It looks good. So, for now, it looks good. I think unless we start traveling across galaxies and meet another civilizations then that one may won't be enough but at the moment it's enough for our humanity purposes however transition from ipv4 to ipv6 is going very very slowly why because there are still many services that are incompatible with ipv6 and they are still operating like old computers critical systems managing old power plants, industrial systems, right? So we cannot switch to IPv6 just like that. It's impossible because we need to rewrite a lot of software and replace a lot of old hardware. Modern computers can do that easily. No worries, they can handle it. But older devices struggle. So at the moment, this addressing space is fragmented. Uh, by the way, I didn't tell you that, but IPv6 is flat. So there are no routing, it's like a flat, right? So in IPv6, theoretically, you can access any other device from any other. So it's flat addressing space. There's no hierarchical like in the IPv4. Uh, and this is great for IoT, but still, uh, yeah, problematic for older devices. So right now, the market is fragmented. You may face some um, devices that are converting between IPv4 and IPv6. So they integrate like part of the IPv6 network, but they wrote it through the IPv4. But the core of the internet is still IPv4, not IPv6. Next. <laughs> Another fact that was driving uh, development of the IoT ecosystems was the development of the data storage. 22 billions of the devices they generate a lot of data they generate it every minute every second every hour it's a huge amount of data right we need to store it somewhere uh, indeed this development was very fast over the last 10 years um, i can remember my first hard drive for my ibm pc it was a seagate 157a and it had warning 20 megabyte of storage space. It was as thick as two floppy drives. What's the floppy drive then, right? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, 
now transplant cars, transplant card that you have in your mobile phones can easily reach two terabyte of data. I bet that many of you are having a mobile phone with the storage at least 128 gigabyte, but many of you have more, right? True. So it changed really rapidly, and it's still changing quite fast. Uh, it's not like a rule that is uh, increasing two times every year, but still going fast, right? So it's really nothing unusual to have a 60 terabyte hard disk drive, I mean this rotable one, they do exist. Uh, even in our server room over there, I have a network area storage of like um, four 18 terabyte drives working together, so that gives me 72 terabytes of data, right? Just to store it. I'm not making a copy of the internet, so no worries, but <laughs> it's, for, uh, it's, for the, it's for data science purposes, but still, uh, you can really, and it's, it's not very expensive, right? Uh, the solid state drives of this size in the 2020, they were like very expensive, but now it's like, an, you know, 10 times cheaper, right? It's still $1,000, but, but you can have it, right? It's not like an, you know, extra, extraordinary price for $1,000, you can... Yeah, so you get 20 terabytes for 350. Oh. Drop it down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, true. So, uh, and you know, it, it regards the, the, this is the consumer technology, but it also impacts what you can have in terms of the chips, right, when constructing the devices. So, this is why I was telling you about those um, cla uh, fog class devices that they are having, like uh, uh, terabyte storages, right, and gigabyte RAMs. Uh, with the end node devices, the big memory is limited by two factors. First is it's limited addressing space, and second is uh, powering, right? So this is the reason why those constrained devices, IoT end node devices, sensors, actuators, they don't have, they don't represent huge amount of data because of those two technology limitations. Uh, short addressing space, which is a technology related how the microcontroller is built inside but also impacts the size because you need to have a pins just to connect its memory externally, right, uh, on the huge bus. And the second is you need to have this um, uh, power resources. The bigger memory, the more energy it consumes. Maybe not the storage, but RAM, right, mostly, and storage as well. Okay, uh, and finally we come to this most right part, it's a cloud. Okay, uh, what I would say about the clouds is developing very fast, we know it, right? <coughs> um, as I said, you can have a personal cloud, like a personal QNAP or um, uh, what's the other one? Synology, right? There are many companies that are doing this, this, this cloud solutions for home. Usually I'm using QNAP at home. Uh, they are like this uh, NAS systems network area storage systems or some. Uh, but they are like a global clouds offered by hosting providers. Many of you as a student, you have free access to them. Like for example, you have a Google Colab resources, right? You can just do some AI for free. Maybe not on the latest hardware, but at least you have it for free and it's ready for operation. You don't need to configure it. You have a Google Cloud, like a Google Drive, Gmail, all those things, and also the services related especially to the Internet of Things, like an authorization, provisioning, uh, storage, communication services. Uh, IBM has a special dedicated IoT cloud called Watson. Uh, Microsoft Azure has IoT support. Uh, Amazon Web Services, they have an IoT support. And many, 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 many more. And moreover, <coughs> yes. That is perhaps what drives the business development of the IoT nowadays. You can easily create a solution where you pay per service. You don't pay a constant amount of cash, but you pay per use. Which means, for example, if your project is scaling up, then you naturally have more income, but you also pay a little bit more for services. It's like a treat a software as a service. 
and pay for it, right? You rent a flexible resources, not fixed one like years ago. Years ago, you needed to buy hosting, and when you had a need just to you know, increase your business, you needed to have, have another hosting and just you know, move it to the new hosting, right? Right now, it's no longer the case. Because of the growth of the virtualization, containerization, and shared resources, like an abstraction layer over many hardware machines. Uh, it is available virtually for everyone because you can start from paying a quite small amount and then grow over the time as needed without the need of instant switching from one system to another, right? You just grow and the resources grow with your solution, which is very nice. And also, we have a wider acceptance of business intelligence. It's not only to Corpo. We'll talk about this in context of the scenarios in the next lecture, perhaps, or maybe we'll start in this one. But anyway, in the case of uh, your generation, a new generation, you're much more open to share your information. Obviously, yeah, you don't, but I know that some people do understand the importance of privacy. But in general, I would say I'm sure that more of most of you is using a Facebook account, is using Instagram, is using Gmail, is using WhatsApp, TikTok. No, neither right, but anyway. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is uh, if you would go for the <laughs> privacy policy that is there, I mean, no one reads that because it's like a couple of pages long, right? And you need to have a, a experience to be a good lawyer to understand what is actually saying that. But if you do understand it, you would never sign and click OK. <laughs> because uh, even if you trust you don't, you share this data at least with the company for many proposals. Yeah. I mean, mom yeah, you need to accept, accept. Yeah, your phone's already affected with that. So what I'm, uh, I'm trying to tell you that you're uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily, uh, involuntarily uh, more open to share your information, which then comes as a business intelligence because uh, the companies, they may reuse this data, right, for your, for example, for advertising which is common in Google, right? Uh, but this is like also, for example, for using the Facebook, where uh, uh, from the two years, it will show up the response. And for example, if you talk with the user, and uh, if he reacts, then it will show up your camera, which is obvious. Yeah. But you see the camera, because, for example, there is, uh, I want to know when you look at the phone, or the pictures, or the Instagram. Really? Exactly. So I said, it just happens, yeah. right? Yes. That was cookie, yeah, but uh -huh. yeah, they use all the devices they can access. I mean, you can even be surprised, but uh, <coughs> my son is using this Google Pixel phone, which is naturally integrated with those all 
um, assistants, right? And those assistants are actually listening uh, 24 by 7 what is going on in our home. I was surprised, but I just check it what is the mobile phone is connecting through the router, right? Which, what are the roads? So it's instantly keeping the data. I was shocked because we started to discuss about some sort of the car, but just, you know, verbally. Which then happened that I had instantly an offers of those cars for purchase on Google. So, but I didn't, I didn't use my computer to look for this car. We just discussed it. Exactly. So this is this is how it this is how it happens nowadays, right? So it's uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, did you heard about the neural link? By yeah. So okay. Anyway, let's get back to actually almost the last part of this uh, presentation. So uh, next technologies that are standing behind are like very software related. Mm. You know that the first operating system was, uh, I mean, popular in the PC computers was MS-DOS. Well, actually, it was CPM before, but it was single-threaded, so you could do one thing at a time. Uh, everything you know to do in parallel, you have to do in interrupts. Uh, naturally, because of the specification of the IoT, it is like you need to do the things asynchronously. Why? First, your device needs to communicate with the network, which requires some resources and some activities, some tasks, like receive the packet, send the packet, even just acknowledge I'm alive, right, without the sending. On the other hand, you also definitely need to contact sensors or maybe grab some incoming information from the user, like user push the button, right? You need to handle many things in the very constrained environment in parallel. This is why I said just a couple of minutes before, that we need an operating system for the EndNote devices, which is this RTOS. Yeah? In theory, if our CPU is fast, we can just do everything one, like only one thing at a time. Yeah. Just this is how the RTOS works. Okay. Yeah, you, you have a tasks, right? And you have your priorities of the tasks. And then you just put the task. When the one task is finished, it goes to another task, right? So it could, it could be like handling a network, reading the sensors, reading user, and it happens really fast. Uh, I didn't tell you about the uh, CPU speed in the uh, case of, for example, Arduino. It's like in between 12 and 48 megahertz. depends on which Arduino we're talking about. It's not actually quite low. It's quite fast, I would say. But if we talk about, for example, ESP microcontroller, the frequency can go up to 400 megahertz. Obviously, it consumes quite a lot of energy then, but still, you can have it for a short time, right? For a burst, make calculations, go asleep. So, those EndNote devices, in terms of the CPU, they do not usually struggle. The struggle is RAM and energy. And those are the key factors that you need to remember about when developing the software. Because it's really easy to run out of uh, RAM and flash resources on those EndNote devices. This is not the case in the FOC class, that's another story, but in the EndNote. So, we have a multi-core processors. By the way, uh, ESP32 is triple core. It has two major cores and one real-time low-power core, which is uh, initiated when the other go for sleep. So we'll talk about this on the hardware. And uh, there are even the machines that are having uh, more cores, those who are those that are based on the ARM architecture, which are ARM architecture is mostly on four class devices, though, those more powerful, right, in the middle of the stack. Uh, they can go even up to a couple of uh, dozen, of course. Um, uh, I wonder if you know it, but M1, M2, all those versions of Apple processors, they're ARM based now, like your mobile phones. They are not Intel based. They are ARM-based, so they are more common actually with this four-class uh, IoT devices than with the PC computers, in terms of the technology, of course, standing behind the CPU. The 
could be, but they have this M2 Ultra, M2 something, and they differ in the number of the cores, right? This GPU cores, neural cores, and this main cores, right? So there are like a multi-core mesh and steel, right? So and this is this part here, like a multi-processor systems, right? So actually multi-core systems, I would rather say, so multi-core processors, yeah. So even in the end node devices, there are multi-core CPUs now, right? Or MCUs, actually. In the fog class device, it is natural that they are multi-core just for the time, and I, maybe Arduino, I'm not sure what was the CPU in the first Arduino, but it, maybe it was single core, but it's gone, it's like a history. And the modern one, it has four cores, right, mostly. And there are even the machines that are having six or eight, actually, uh, they are in your mobile phones, right? This Exynos, it's like a four performance core, four low power core, something like that, right? So, I mean, this really varies, right? So there's a number of the differences. Uh, so, GPU-based data processing, this NVIDIA CUDA, we discussed it already, right? Because if you have a GPU processing, they naturally it's optimized towards video and the AI processing. So that helps a lot. But in this FOC class mostly, right? In the Edge class, uh, there are some AI experiments with this Edge processing, but it's still the problem with the RAM and the energy, mostly the energy there, right? Now, Dedicated FPGA-based solutions for real-time complex data processing. What I mean here is that the FPGA is like a hardware implementation of the algorithm. It's not flexible because you cannot to, to change it into reflash it or reprogram the FPGA. But it's running in the real-time. It's very nice, so it's very fast. So for example, if you have an encapsulated processing chain of the information, you can make a hardware solution to process it quite easily. Xilinx is doing these systems. Uh, you can make them and make them a part of the IoT right? The device. It's, it's quite doable. <laughs> and there's uh, cloud-based scalable resources, which is what we discussed just before, right? Pay per use, not pay per service instant value, but pay per use and scale it up and down as you need it. Uh, new programming paradigms. <laughs> what I mean here is service-oriented architecture, which is the king in the IoT. Um, we use a web daily, right? Majority of the services is moved to web right now. Even if you have mobile applications, there are really many mobile applications that are built like an encapsulation of the web page, actually. Some of them, like a banking system, are separate because it's about uh, security. But then they communicate with the backend. So this multi-level organization of the architecture where you have a front side, a backend, it impacts the way that we develop the software. A bit also impacts a way that we develop the software for the IoT. Why? Because well, here I need to, again, refer to the protocols that you don't know yet. But, for example, the COAP uh, protocol, which is uh, like an application-level protocol for the IoT, it works like a REST. You know the REST services, I hope, at least. No? Okay, imagine the web server hosting a web page for you. You can request for it. So the REST is like a very simplified something that returns you the JSON data. So you send some request and you get some response. In the rest, there are at least four classes of the requests. It's like a get, post, put, and delete. Uh, it's the same in the HTTP, but we mostly don't use them. We use get and post. Post is like sending a form on the web, right? So it's like a post. Get is like an sending a request through the query string. So there's a question mark, and then there's a, a query string there, right? So it can be parsed by the server to understand what, do you, what would you like. So in the REST services, it works this way. What is important is agile development model and cross-space collaboration. Uh, it came with, uh, you know, the original software development model was a waterfall. So first you make an analysis of the customer, then you implement the software, then you make the test and you make an introduction to the customer, right? Uh, it's not very efficient, at least it's considered not to be very efficient nowadays, so we work different way. Just in short, uh, any one of you um, is uh, familiar with uh, Agile methodology of the development? Uh -huh. Okay, in short, 
I can describe. Yeah. Okay. So in short, I can tell you that it works the way that you implement some part of the data of the of the system, but not full, just part of it. Test it and give it to the uh, to use by the by the customer, or you work together. Agile. Yeah. So you make a sprint, something called like a sprint. You agree with the customer what you do. You implement it and you give it to the world, right? And then you go next step, next step, next step. So we build it like in, in the chunks. It has a drawback because it's quite hard to get the documentation. But there are automated systems that will help you to do that. But it goes perfectly into these microservices. Because, for example, if you want to have a device, IoT device, that is giving you a readings of an environment data, which is air pressure, humidity, and the temperature. So you can first implement a service that is giving you air pressure because it's usually a separate sensor. Then you extend it with the temperature and the humidity because this is the same sensor, so it's quite easy, right? And you just set up the services one by one. Obviously, the consumer of the data needs to know that their services are unavailable and they will be available in the future, right? So we just update the firmware and you have it. That goes perfectly with this microservices and the service-oriented application model, right? So those two, they like and go together hand by hand. Now, containerization, uh, it is not for IoT, but it's rather for the development. If you need a development chain for any IoT technology, nowadays you don't install it mostly on the computer. You just download a Docker container, a Docker image. You set up a container, and it's ready just to connect to and use it for development. This is not on the development stage, not on the use stage, the software development stage, right? Uh, but it's also for the services. For example, uh, another protocol you don't know yet, but you will get familiar, is MQTT, Message Queue Telemetry Transportation. It's dedicated for the IoT. You will use it on the labs, by the way, COEP as well. Uh, so MQTT is, uh, requires a broker. Uh, I set up here quite fancy communication uh, with the Wi-Fi and uh, message relaying, so I needed to do that on the separate device, which is actually the Raspberry Pi by that door over there. Uh, hidden, it's not like old one, Raspberry Pi 2, but it's powerful enough. But if I were you to test it quickly, you just download and ready MQTT broker container, you start it and it just works. Perhaps all you need to do is configure the security, like a user is the password, right? And eventually some other ports if you don't want to go over the standard one. It's great because it speeds up a development really, really, really fast. Now, this asynchronous application model, it is what I told you about parallel handling many things. Communication, sensing, actuating, interfacing, right? So there's uh, embedded operating systems like RTOS, they come handy here. But obviously you can do it yourself. Even this Arduino model that we will use on the labs where you have a setup and the loop. This loop can be like handling many tasks in a row. So for example, check if there is a sensor data. Yes, read it. Check if there is a message from the network. Yes, read it. But obviously, under it, under the hood, it has a separate row times that are checking, communicating with this network and grabbing this data for you. So uh, you need to remember this in any case, that there is always something behind in form of the libraries, right? They communicate. No? Finally, public repositories. Right. So I hope everyone is familiar with GitHub and GitLab. Are you? If you don't get get familiar, please. It's like an obligatory for software developers and hardware developers. Uh, the future is that it perfectly organized the work with this agile development model. You create a task. You make a branch of the software to not let the implementation disturb other implementations. Moreover, you have a continuous integration systems that will, for example, check either your software compiles when you check it in. So we will instantly have a feedback that you, for example, forget to close the parentheses or give a semicolon at the end of the, of the line. But also, you can give it like um, unit tests automated. So for example, build a service, run it either on device or on the virtual device, and test either it works OK. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, which one do you recommend, like GitHub or GitLab? None of the public. We have a private GitLab here. <laughs> It's, again, a Docker container, <laughs> so it was quite simple. 
So uh, if you um, will want to work on the labs with the GitLab, I can provide it for you, the space there, just to use it. Maybe it's not so necessary in case of those, because the projects we are going to do on the labs are quite simple. But if you are willing to, it's up to you. Me, personally, I'm using GitLab, but there's nothing against, against, against the GitHub. But please keep in mind that GitHub is Microsoft. Yeah, Azure, yeah. yeah. Oh, actually, they needed GitHub for um, uh, ChatGPT just to train it. Because the ChatGPT 3.5 is trained on the GitHub. This is why it's so good on answering uh, software questions, right? When you were, please. Oh, they did, yeah. But now there's, you know, GitHub is like, to me, it's open to the corporation, so. Okay, <laughs> easy and cheap access to training, new technology skills via massive online courses, EDX Coursera. Okay, guys, this is what we also do. And you can reuse it like an online course of this, what we do here, just to recall in, in any case. So I told you, I will share it with you in the introduction. But anyway, what I mean here is if you have a new microcontroller, there is really no need to go through the tons of the documentations. Just browse the web and there definitely, there will be a guy who already recorded on how to at least start on YouTube <laughs> or any other platform. Why? Even nowadays, the manufacturers of the hardware, just to promote their hardware, promote their software, promote their solutions, they get the guys that will record the videos and they put them online just to attract developers. This is how it works nowadays. You don't download the tons of the documentation and go for it just to start. You do it eventually if you do some professional. So then you need to go deep. For example, check either this uh, timer is gonna be working with this GPIO and so on, right? But just to bootstrap, make a simple project, you don't need to go through the tons of the documentations. Online course or online resources are usually enough to start. This is uh, IoT world, it's in the internet. Or just give it a name, Internet of Things, right? So it's in the internet. Anyway. So, <laughs> some facts on the soft part of this game. Because we came with the hardware, we came with the infrastructure, we came with the software, but now the social part. People are, if humankind is more, more self, getting more and more self-aware, definitely. Fitness, consumption, medical monitoring, right? This is something that our fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, they didn't have because they didn't have this technology. We use a fitness and we train like a professional in the Olympics in the 1920s. You could compete there, right? Because you train along to what your smartwatch is telling you. So, you share your activities, achievements over the social media. Yeah, and the Mondo is gone, but that's a pity actually, I like it as much. Uh, Strava is now. So, <coughs> we share this information, we compete, even virtually. Maybe you can recall the COVID that it was forbidden to make a mass run, so everyone was running individually with the watch and then sending his data. That was a temporary solution, but still working. <laughs> I know it's funny. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. Well, it's the only option then, right? So, you know, <laughs> it's good you had this teacher. <laughs> no, it's up to you, of course, right? But, uh, you know, um, we use it for communication. So we, we, we want to share because we, we want to have this, you know, self esteem to grow, right? So um, <laughs> that helps, right? Uh, and the next thing is that we no longer want to spend our life on boring tasks. Anyone having an automated vacuum cleaner? No. But mine is actually it's Chinese, so it's tracing, so I have to yeah, just, you know. Yeah, I know, but I, I drop it down the rotor, so. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, 
yeah, the hacking. Uh, uh, I get this one that is washing the floor. It's like a mopping, right? <laughs> so it's mopping this. Yeah. So uh, just to be honest, <coughs> how many times did you try to check either you lock your door because you are not sure, <coughs> isn't it? If you had a smart lock, you will have an instant information that your mobile phone either is closed or not, and you could even remotely close it. It's IoT. Same with, oh, Jesus, I forgot to close the window and there comes a thunderstorm, right? Click the button and it closes. But you lock your door for safety. Yeah. I, mean, I think that posting your door status online opens you up to being less safe. Uh, if it works, yeah, if it talks to the Chinese cloud where you talk to Chinese cloud, that's another story. This is why I choose a local solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah so then that is safer. Yes. Because now it's like if you're a robber, you just go look at the door and unlock it without even needing to go check everyone's door. Yeah. It's opening them to yeah. danger. It's danger. I know it. I'd rather just use the old fashioned lock it or not even. I appreciate that, so, I, so do I. But I'm still considering about some sort of smart lock to know either I use this lock or not. <laughs> because there are smart locks that are actually semi-working, so you close it with the lock uh, right. externally, and it just checks the status. I mean, it can unwind and win this uh, internal part, but... And it's all on your local network. It's all on my local network. No, no, no. That was what I was trying to emphasize in the very beginning. Yeah. This cloud can be either public or private, right? So I'm, I'm, I am all encapsulated in my home, right? Yeah, and the network is separated. For IoT, network is separated. And the, but we have to understand that that's security. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree, absolutely agree. But it's really up to you how you craft it, right? But you know, on the other hand, I have a friend, he has the smart look as well, right? And uh, But he's like a full full system. And he told me, uh, I was, why did you install it? I was interested in why, why he decided to do that. And he told me, you know, because it's quite common that I, uh, when the delivery comes, like a DHL or FedEx or whatever, I just send the guy a code how to access my home and he comes in and drops a package and closes. It's like a one-time use, so you open the door, you put the package inside, and you close the door, and it locks. I said, nice, but aren't you afraid of something that may happen, right? You can time how long he's in the house. Yeah. And uh, so no, he has a camera. He has a camera, right? So, so there is a security camera in his corridor, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's another story, <laughs> of course. Yeah, you mean for rental? Rent for rental, rent. yeah. Okay, guys, so we continue with the scenarios. And uh, uh, there are some more uh, these key facts and the technologies that are standing behind the IoT. So let me quickly describe and go through them. So we are talking about <laughs> laziness <laughs> in the humanity. Just to automate some, some, uh, some things like uh, keeping this uh, intelligent house, uh, so it means uh, also, which is quite hot stuff right now, uh, about the energy management, right? Um, you can imagine it like, for example, automated turning on and off of the home appliances when you have uh, solar panels and there is a sunlight like today at the moment. So automated system can, for example, start your washing machine or dishwasher when there is an um, a head of, of energy or in general when the energy is cheaper right because uh, it is possible to go on this market prices right now with the energy uh, but intelligent house is also about the heating ventilation security cameras all this stuff <coughs> 
autonomous vacuum cleaners, we just discussed it before, internet fridge. Well, that was something that actually was considered like uh, one of the first things in the smart homes. However, um, it didn't trigger actually, because there's always the problem how to check what's inside the fridge. The fridge can order over the internet, but uh, it cannot trace the contents right inside, or actually it can, but in a limited way. So it's not so easy because, you know, <coughs> clicking on the fridge and telling the fridge what's inside and for Max, for example, it left like a half of the um, <laughs> of the of the yogurt telling it it is ridiculous, right? So no one is doing that. So perhaps adaptation of this internet fridge is quite limited. It's uh, internet fridge at the moment is more like uh, internet uh, oven, right? That will give you a recipes, uh, eventually give you a calendar tasks, right? But uh, not necessarily order the food, which is actually um, well, a little bit uh, of pity that it doesn't go this way, but still, yeah, it does. So this is how it works. Okie dokie. Um, right, health monitoring and activity monitoring for elderly. This is something that is very hot in terms of the Internet of Things, but also very demanding in case of uh, security. Uh, I mean here, like a monitoring of the elderly persons, for example, fault detection or a, a smart furniture that can, smart chair that can detect that the person, for example, is sitting there and not moving for a longer time, which may be symptoms of dementia. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of uh, solutions developing, but it can be also something like an automatic rescue, right? All cars, as far as you know, all cars in Europe right now, they need to have this uh, new cars, right? So when you buy it from the, for the first time, in the genuine market, they have to be equipped with this kind of the system <coughs> that ensures that there's an automated call for the rescue when there is an accident detected, right? So on one hand, you have the detection of the accident. On the other, you have this uh, online services. They base mostly on the GSM. So it is like uh, making a phone call or sending some uh, automated system. Okay, ecology and this energy harvesting. It regards this green energy and the prosumers. Prosumers is uh, someone who has his own or her own power plant, right? So you have like a sonar panels, maybe you have a wind turbine or a water turbine, right? Depends on where you live, what kind of the capabilities you have. So then you are both consuming an energy, but also creating an energy, right? So you can balance it with the grid or you can store it. If you have an energy store, you can store it for your own purposes. Okay, uh, the challenge with the energy at the moment, if you ask, it's not about creating the energy, the green energy, it's about storing this energy and transporting it from one location to another. Oil and fusel, um, 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 uh, like a coal and uh, natural gas, right? Um, they are all, easily transportable. We get used to it over the pipe or over the ships or the train. The problem with the electrical energy is that using a batteries, which are quite heavy, to uh, charge them and then discharge them is not economical at all because um, first, charging takes time and discharging takes time. And the second, the weight of the battery is quite uh, inefficient in terms of how much energy it can transport, comparing to um, uh, to other uh, classical resources of the energy. So this is the problem, right? How to store the energy. Maybe in the IoT it's not uh, such a problem because, you know, a number of charge recharge cycles in the IoT devices easily let them operate. Of course, I'm talking about the end node ones, right? Those uh, constraints. They can easily go like uh, after even 10 years. So the batteries are rather long lasting, right? There is no so much so frequent in, in majority of the applications. Or even you go into the chemical batteries, not rechargeable ones, right? So you just replace it with a new one, like a coil. Uh, this coin batteries, uh, CR 2032 or 2025, right? Popular ones. So <coughs> uh, in the IoT world, it's not a problem, but applications in the IoT that will ease this energy storage definitely are the future, right? So like managing this energy, smart metering, right? And so on. And finally, we come into the mobile devices. Yeah, right. 
So you may ask, either the mobile device is a part of the IoT. Mm. The answer is not straightforward. Yes and no. Uh, definitely, if you own modern mobile phone, like for example Samsung, the first thing that shows up, it's going to be like uh, connected to your smart things, like your smart TV, maybe some other devices that you have at home. Definitely, it's a part of the IoT ecosystem. Uh, however, uh, uh, regarding this here, what we are discussing, like a mobile devices in the context of the open IoT infrastructures. There are three facts that you need to consider. First, <coughs> they have a rich user interface. If you want to implement, like for example, there is a sensor over there by the door, right? It's like it has a buttons, it has a display, just to control the temperature in the room. It requires a lot of effort to make a user interface in a constrained system, right? It needs to go asleep, you need to have an efficient display which doesn't consume a lot of energy. So, sometimes we make it opposite. IoT devices have very limited user interface, like for example, status LED, or maybe 2.0 and a push button that you can reset the device or reboot, right? And that's all. While everything else happens on the network. So this way, your mobile phones becomes a natural user interface to the system, right? And this is very easy because in the majority of the IoT systems, there is somewhere, uh, usually, a web interface or maybe an application that it connects to. Like, for example, very popular WLED application for your mobile phones that you can control the smart LEDs, right? Uh, when you integrate them with this WLED firmware. So it is either the access to the web page or a dedicated application for Android or iOS to keep it working, right? And this way you can proceed to make your, your own user interfaces. There are IoT dashboards that will simplify it. <coughs> so there are ready solutions, like for example, Node-RED, uh, that you can use just to create a dashboard. Uh, Node-RED is also a protocol converter, but that's another story, but it can be easily made to have a dashboard, IoT dashboard. And then you can access it to your mobile phone over the web. It's uh, mobile phones friendly if you design the page well. So uh, easily goes with the vertical interfaces and horizontal one like a PCs, right? The next things in the mobile is they are naturally wireless, right? So you out of the box have a Wi-Fi, GSM, uh, near field communication, NFC, right? Uh, Bluetooth, mm, sometimes some um, ultra wideband, uh, GPS, right? So it's all naturally. However, the mobile phones, they usually out of the box do not have a uh, radio capable to collaborate with the IoT networks on this AO215.4, unfortunately. So either you need to have something connected to it or go through the proxy, which is quite com most common perhaps, right? So you go through the gateway. Uh, or maybe other way, devices go through the gateway to the IP network like Wi-Fi. And you connect your mobile to the Wi-Fi then. <coughs> mm. As we said, we accept the surveillance and monitoring, right? So a part of the IOE world is very, very uh, dedicated to uh, image and video processing. Mm. In that case, I could tell, for example, a Chinese uh, system that is uh, checking uh, virtually everyone in the, uh, in the country and giving you this uh, credits like uh, social score. Right? And based on the social score, for example, you can have a passport or you cannot. Your child can go to the uh, better school, better university or not. So it's like controlling uh, um, uh, a society which is uh, <laughs> well, uh, not widely accepted in Europe because of the privacy and democracy, but it's quite wide accepted in, uh, for example, in China, right? And it's uh, omnipresent. Okay. So, <coughs> Industry 4.0 now. How Internet of Things relates to the Industry 4.0? Well, in general, we have something like called an industrial Internet of Things. It's a separate branch using slightly different approaches, usually real-time operating systems that require devices to work in the real time because in the manufacturing process, uh, the um, uh, manufacturing uh, chain can uh, require, for example, interaction on the millisecond or even quicker, right, time. So I have to go in the, uh, in the real time. 
Uh, and also, there are different standards. I mentioned that, for example, the CAN protocol or this old RS485, RS which is like in the standard standard for many devices, is uh, present in those kind of the um, uh, industrial uh, Internet of Things. However, uh, Industry 4.0 is like an application for an industrial IoT. Uh, whatever you know about the Industry 4.0, it is like a next generation after Industry 3. Um, well, let's get backwards because the easiest is to show it up on the example of the automotive uh, manufacturing. So, uh, in the very beginning, the cars were made um, manually. Right, so there was a guy coming, and they were like building the car from scratch. I mean, some cars are done this way up to today, like a Rolls Royce, perhaps, or Aston Martin, right? But uh, it's uh, let's say just a sort of quite unusual in mass market. Uh, it was Ford, I believe, Mr. Ford, in U.S. that he made it somehow opposite. He invented an automation with the manufacturing chain, where people are working and are doing some particular thing, not all things, but some particular things, they use tools. For example, one is assembling the wheels, the other is assembling the windshield, the other is assembling the front lines, and so on. Prior to his invention, every one of those guys needed to come to the car. Now it's different. The car is slowly moving over the transportation system. And you just have some time slot to assemble things there, and it goes to another person. That naturally, constructs the way the car should be built and the order. So that was actually industry three, I believe. What is the serious drawback of this approach? I mean, besides it was a revolution that days, right? In the 1920s, I guess it was, or 1910, the 1920s invented. Uh, the Ford T was the first of built this way. But what is the serious drawback of the approach to manufacturing? It's not flexible. And it's very fragile for the situation when the delivery chain is bro broken. For example, imagine that one of the guys is sick. Or there is no windshields. It automatically blocks, and everything prior then stops, right? Because it cannot continue. You need, for example, to go to the warehouse, bring new uh, windshields or new lamps, right? <coughs> or eventually wait for the delivery of the sub subcontractor. And that is Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is an answer to this idea. What it means is, imagine that instead of having a single, I may consider it like we are doing a step backwards, but it's actually, it's not. Instead of having a continuous manufacturing chain, we make a universal stance were usually robots, eventually people, but mostly robots, can do more than one thing. So for example, there are robots that can either assemble wheels or put a lamp or put a windshield, but this is one robot that is doing this thing, okay? And there are many of those places. In the natural delivery chain, it would be like this robot is doing, for example, lamps, the other is doing windshields, and the other is doing wheels. But because every single car is being transported independently. They can be rerouted as there are free resources. So in case there are no windshields, they are gone, right? The one brought from the magazine or the delivery chain is broken. This robot is automatically reconstructed to put more effort to install the lamps. And then the other robots will all come to installing the windshields when the windshields come. This way you are much more efficient in terms of time time delivered to the market, energy also, because you don't make a standby. Standby is also a costful, right? And most of all, a side effect of this approach is you have a flexibility on manufacturing, which means that you can make customization of the products much easier than on the classical chain. So that was Industry 4.0. <coughs> Surprisingly, I can tell you that we have this kind of the factory 
uh, in the Opolsky Voivodeship, west from here. But it's not about uh, automotive, or actually not directly. Uh, it's Gustav Wolf company. They make. Uh, they are famous for making the ropes for the lifts, those stale ropes that they are hanging. But they also do a lot of uh, this uh, uh, metal mm, for a tires. For the you know, they make a tire inside. It's like a metal part, like a metal net. Yeah, inside. So they make it. So in 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 general, they are on the stale. So what is this? Uh, is uh, this company is like example of industry for zero, but they didn't make to automate everything. And by the way, I didn't mention one important thing about this. Ah, here, self-organizing and flexible manufacturing system. Self-organizing, what it means. It's not a man or a woman that is pushing the button and saying this robot is doing that. It's an automated management system that is deciding and telling, look, robot, you have to do right now windshields, right? Because they came from the warehouse and we have uh, plenty of them and there's uh, 10 cars waiting to assemble windshields, but uh, prior that you are doing lamps, but right now please switch and install windshields, right? It's automated. So returning to our example, the Gustav Wolf company, it was funny because I was talking to the guys who are working there and they told me, it's quite a big factory, but they are like on seven or 10 persons there only. <laughs> Uh, everything is automated, but the problem is that actually we do not understand what, what's going on. Even the delivery chain is automated. So, for example, they are surprised because there comes a truck with the spindle of the stale. And they didn't order that, right? Explicitly, the system has ordered it just to come. So the driver comes and he's surprised no one knows it. Just to open the gate, right? It, it wasn't automated. So uh, there comes there comes an automated forklift just to unload it. But there was a problem. There was uh, one machine that you need to unwind the spindle and load this first part of the stale rod inside manually by the human. And actually, the system was calling a human operator to come, like a robot. Perhaps you heard about the Industry 4.5, did you? Or 5.0. Okay, Industry 4.5 was an answer to this problem. How to integrate people with the system that is managed by the machine and operating on the machines. How to integrate people into that in case they need it, right? Like in this case. Because it's not so straightforward. You need to understand what's going on just not to get into the trouble, right? You need to know where you need to be, what you need to do. And you need to interface. I mean, things have changed. People do not no longer tell the machines what to do, right? The machines tell people what to do, which is shocking a little bit, right? But this industry for zero. So industry 4.5 was about uh, adding this uh, human back. Okay, uh, what is the part of this Industry 4.0 and uh, cyber physical system is industrial IoT is something we called digital twin, which means that every device, sensor, component of manufacturing process has its digital representation in the virtual world. You don't necessarily need to think about this like um, virtual reality. No, I mean, for human, that would be quite consumable, right? If you show this factory in the virtual reality and have, for example, arrows showing you how the forklift is going to, to travel. Uh, but it's rather having a digital uh, twin inside some numerical system, right? So we can tell always, like, for example, this sensor is at the moment having this data. That actuator for the moment is rotated to this position and so on, right? And also on the conceptual level, this automated UGV is going to the on this path to that location, right? Just to uh, keep the um, uh, just to keep the um, uh, things clear. Why? Because uh, you can optimize the capabilities. You can optimize cost and energy efficiency and time to market delivery. But you also can understand then how to introduce, for example, changes to your manufacturing process. How you can afford it. So. This business intelligence is part of making this data collecting, right? So everything is collected, and this is really the big data in the in the in the big factory, because there's a dozen of sensors, actuators, devices, right, playing all together. So you need to put it somewhere into the system. For this reason, such a factory usually has its own cloud solution. Hmm? Okay, let's push forward. Now. Uh, development of the semantic-based communication and semantic 
oriented data representation. And this is actually uh, a data science or an AI as we see it now. Over last year, we had a serious development in this technology, like ChatGPT, these language models, or BART from Google, they changed the name right now, but it was BART formerly, right? So those are the models that you can ask a question in the natural language. Uh, obviously, you usually type, right? But there are already an application that converts your speech into the question that you send, they send to the ChatGPT, and that one can answer textually, and then you can convert it to the text to voice and listen. So it's like an interaction with the person. Yeah. Of course, it's still not perfect. But indeed, there is. OK, so <coughs> uh, at the moment, the IoT uses synthetic protocols. Even if they are semantic on some level, like application level protocols are uh, semantic in terms of, for example, they're XML-based or so they may use uh, schema definition, right, the XML, or they are textual, uh, they are predefined, they are synthetic. It's not like I come here, I introduce myself, and then you naturally know who I am, right? It doesn't work this way. Uh, in case of the IoT, one of the challenges is just to automatically let some devices be connected into the network while others are excluded because they may be uh, foes, not friends. So this is a serious challenge because <coughs> actually you never know that I am Piotr, right? Because I didn't show you my ID, but at least you can tell because you have seen me in a couple of different contexts. So you know I have a room over there and stated my name and I can enter there so it seems like it's me, I have a badge. So, and this is how we would like in the future, how we would like IoT devices to work, to constitute a federation of let's say friends or devices that they can accept new ones and ensure that it's okay, right? We don't let someone in who is a foe. We just let in only those who were provisioned. And now provisioning is done um, manually or automated way, but either it's like a list of the devices to be accepted by some ID usually, which can be a MAC address, can be IP address, or can be like an ident identifier that we represent to the network to join. Okay. Uh, That would be the best, right? If the devices could come and act like a meet and greet. And it would be the perfect if the device could interact one another like we do right now, using just a natural language. I wonder if you have seen a recent uh, speech of the chief of the NVIDIA. Yeah, he claimed that the programming languages are going soon to be uh, replaced by natural language processing. Uh -huh. Um, I can agree to that, right? It's quite possible. So it may happen one day. Maybe not very quickly, but probably to some extent, right? It will slowly replace some application. Perhaps it will start from the high-level languages like a Python, for example, right? Which is um, quite a um, high-level one. Okay. But still, at the moment, we need this natural language processing. So just to create those natural interfaces. And here again comes mobile phones, right? Just in help. They are powerful enough to grab some information from the, uh, from the IoT network, either directly or indirectly, and convert it and show it to the user even the way that you speak. Uh, many TVs are enabled right now that you can talk to the pilot in either language and then tell it what to do, right? I mean, smart TVs. So they are able to process it. Obviously, they do not process this data locally. They send it somewhere to the cloud for processing, usually. Not always, but usually. At least Samsung has it. <laughs> OK. So uh, how does artificial intelligence comes here to this user interfacing? Well, first, we want these devices to become like a members of the society, right? Like we are here, university society, or student society, or a group, and the teachers, and so on. And the devices may be a part of the network where the society is considered to be the network then, right, of the devices. So they can accept or regret access to some, just to join. Hmm? Uh, they should not only be smart, 
but also intelligence. Well, that's happening right now because of the wider omnipresence of AI. Uh, obviously, those are the end node devices that are on the very end of this revolution because of the constrained resources, but it still develops. So I would say that um, those devices uh, should be intelligent in terms, for example, they could adapt to the user, not just being smart in terms of they can measure something and do some activity on the predefined loop or predefined condition, but to be really intelligent, so to learn an environment they become a member of, right? Uh, that was what I was just saying before. Perhaps the best in this classroom would be not to keep the temperature constant, but maybe vary it depending on the how people appear here, right? Obviously, there is a schedule, so that may use a synthetic schedule. So then it's smart. But if it learns when the people come here every week, then it's intelligent. So this is the difference, right? Uh, cognitive, right? Able to learn, understand, and decide. And there is a number of the uh, assistants. Actually, Alexa is gone, right? As far as I know, they closed the project, or they are about to close it. Uh, but there are those others, like this Bixby, uh, Cortana. Is Cortana still in Windows? It is. OK, it's definitely Google Assistant, right? OK. Um, Actually, oh, I will show it by the end. OK, so paradigms of the IoT, mobility, and related to wireless networking. This mobility with connectivity. Hmm? New protocols, definitely. And that's still under development, because I'm not telling here about those protocols that they're already present for IoT. I would rather target those that are in the future like those I said, meet and greet, right? Talking the natural language to another device. Right now, we also face the problem that uh, different manufacturers use different standards and different protocols, so devices are not able to interact one another, right? But you come from the different origins, right? You come from different countries, and we can talk using some common language. At, at least I hope you understand my English, so. Uh, do you? OK. <laughs> Let's just ensure. And obviously the data science, which can be on the mass scale, on the basic big data, but also on the small scale, like having the sensor over there just to learn who, when comes here to this very room, just to uh, optimize energy use. Okay, so as I said, mobility involves wireless communication, and those networks are omnipresent. Standardization enables devices of various kinds to intercommunicate one another. Well, that doesn't go very good <laughs> at the moment, but indeed there are some open protocols that if the devices follow, then uh, they're able to communicate in the common standards. And this is the machine-to-machine -machine communication, right? Now, we need to go out of scope of the existing communication schemas first. We want to let the device create new connection structures themselves. Why? This is something we call enrollment challenge. In the IoT, okay, in the PC world, when you come with a new laptop, what you do first? You power it on, and then you configure it. You need to connect it to your Wi-Fi. Or maybe you need to connect it to the GSM, you have a modem inside, right? Put the SIM card. Then you need to provide a user password, connect all the services. So imagine right now that your um, building is equipped with 100,000 sensors. It's easily doable. Consider, for example, Burj Khalifa in, in, in Dubai. It's very high, right? Now imagine that you need to manually configure 100,000 sensors. It could be days, months, years of hard work for a team of the people. There's no way it needs to work this way. This is an enrollment challenge. We need to let the devices automatically constitute a federation, also a network, because in what I didn't tell you yet about the network, it is that um, 
in many, many scenarios, IoT network is a mesh network. It's so much different than the star topology network where you connect all the devices to the single access point at your home. In the mesh networks, the devices create communication in between them, and moreover, mesh network is evolving over time, which means that right now it has this structure, but in a moment, because some devices can go to sleep, some devices can be overloaded with routing, so they will regret routing, the roads will be different, so the connection between the devices will be different. Obviously, they need to be in range, right? So, But assuming there is a number of the devices and the range is bigger than the next one, next stop, then they constitute a sort of the mesh, and the communicates are routed with uh, dynamic roads, not static ones. So <laughs> the devices should then behave like meet and, meet and greet, right, with the anonymous identities, which means that, um, for example, if someone comes and replaces the sensor because it's faulty, or reboots it because of the battery replacement, then it should join the network seamlessly, right, again. But on the other hand, we don't want the other sensors from the other building to register in this network, right? So we have to be separated. And this is the challenge, how to distinguish them. And as I said, understand one another without knowing exact communication protocols. So this is in the future. It's not now, but this is in the future. Now, the role of the AI in the context of the IoT, we already discussed it a couple of times. But, uh, IoT ecosystem is supposed to be intelligent. Either it's on the single device level or like whole this ecosystem, right? So it can be implemented in really a variety of things. For example, you can have a data mining in the cloud and then you can reconfigure the devices, right? The other is that the devices are powerful enough to make a data mining or a training of the AI models locally, which is not very common, but it's still doable, for example, with the reinforcement learning. So gaining knowledge based on the data and applying it to the daily use is crucial for successful implementation of modern IoT solutions, which means that the people do not want just anymore just a single device. They want to have them to be smart, and that puts a challenge to the developers. Yeah, yeah to be personalized. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we want to interact with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nowadays, majority of the AI systems, they are composed of two stages of implementation. The first is, obviously, you need to have a model, but you need to train a model. And the second is you use it. Obviously, there are different ones, like reinforced learning, where this continuous improvement is embedded. So that's not the case. But honestly saying, uh, as you see, for example, as the chat GPT works or other systems work, they are like a snapshots of some knowledge, and you just use it. <laughs> Eventually, they develop, based on that, another snapshot, like chat GPT 3.5 or 4.0, uh, and you have it in uh, another. So it is possible to use even the edge class, but mostly fork layers of so those uh, Raspberry Pis, right? Um, Training requires huge computation resources, so we train it on the mainframes, on the computers, and we mostly use powerful GPUs, like this cluster of RTX uh, NVIDIAs. Uh, slowly, modern processors are being equipped with uh, neural parts that can help to implement a neural so AI. And it's not only Intel, but also those Apple, right? So M2 Ultra, as I can remember, or some of the most modern. They do have a dedicated course for neural uh, network implementation for, for processing of this, of this stuff. But mostly at the moment, the kink is NVIDIA. So it's a kink of um, uh, AI, and the majority of the models are trained on the GPU. Okay. <coughs> I was mentioning it was Raspberry Pi and this NVIDIA Jetson. NVIDIA Jetson can train a simple model because it has a GPU quite powerful, but don't think about like you can create on this uh, NVIDIA Jetson a uh, model that is able, for example, like a YOLO to retrain it with all categories of the images it recognizes, forget it. It's for the mainframe computer for days or depends on the, on the social, so not on, the, not on this class of the devices. Thank <laughs> you. 
that's all. Uh, majority of the data analysis is done either via statistics, supervised, unsupervised, or reinforced learning. The reinforced learning is the most natural for IoT uh, small devices because it uses instant improvement. The reinforced learning works the way that the device behaves some, some, for some excitation and then it's uh, um, uh, graded or penalized for that. So it learns, okay, if I was penalized, I have to do something different. If uh, it was okay, then it means that the, that was accepted by the user, right? So this is, let's say, quite easily doable. Far more easier doable than supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, supervised learning is very common for, for example, for image recognition. This is when you give an example to the model and you tell, okay, this is an apple, this is a train, this is the car, this is the pedestrian, this is a biker, this is the light on, this is the light off, right? So, uh, in those contexts, right? Uh, it is useful in the cases that you cannot obtain a model of the problem analytical way, just to make an AI, right? So, so in this case, you use supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, uh, is uh, rather for discovering new knowledge. So you drop uh, data and you don't know what to expect. You look for the results. Either it brought something reasonable or not. So this is for discovering new relations that a uh, regular human cannot see, for example, right? So we drop there some sort of uh, data and it's trying to learn and find some correlations or rules or conditions, right? This sort of. Okay, now. A couple of technological uh, remarks. So in general, if you consider how a model or AI implementation looks like and what frameworks you are using, perhaps uh, here is a part of the big computers. So either it's like a powerful workstation laptop or a cluster of the devices. Depends on the problem scale, right? The most common are TensorFlow, and this is naturally made by Google, um, as far as I know, and the PyTorch, which is, on the other hand, invented by Facebook for those two. But there are many other, like uh, ML, M MXNet or CLearn, many, many other. This is just an example. But if I would approach, I would say this one and that one are the most common, at least for students. But now it comes a problem, because you train a model on this PC computer, what to do next, right? How to port it to the IoT device. You need to export it. And obviously each of these frameworks, they do have uh, dedicated formats, and on the right-hand side, an application can be like executing of this model. So it goes either via CPU, GPU, FPGA, which is hardware implementation, or a sort of accelerate an AI uh, system. <coughs> what I mean here is that this port is done either by the proprietary protocol, I mean proprietary uh, file exchange uh, with the model specific for the framework, but then you need the specific framework here as well. Or for the universal one, which is called Open Neural Network Exchange. It is great because it gives you a flexibility between a variety of platforms, but it has a serious drawback. This is developing very fast. So new versions come here and the new futures come here. And the on and X is specific for the future, so it means that it needs to be able to provide you with the particular futures. And it's always late by at least one or two generations. So if you are going to use the most recent TensorFlow and its most recent futures, Forget about going with ON and X, you need to go with the uh, specific uh, export format. And also, we need to have a TensorFlow implementation on the receiver side, which is mostly called TensorFlow Lite. You can find it for NVIDIA, you can find it for Raspberry Pi, even for Espressif. 
But obviously not every model can be accepted because it requires some resources, right? So that's another story. But on the technical one. So ONNX is good for exchange of the, let's say, classical AI that is not the most, is not using the most recent um, uh, model features. Uh, otherwise, unfortunately, you're stuck to uh, use the um, proprietary formats, which means then they are not portable. And perhaps you may struggle to find an appropriate library to implement loading of this model on the target side, right? Okay. Okay. Um, video no longer exists. It's a pity. I wanted to show you something funny. Okay, okay, let me see if I can go through HDMI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How integration of the systems can look like. I think there will be advertised. personalized no longer <laughs> okay guys so that was a short gap and uh, like a funny part of this presentation but honestly uh, yeah I hope that the IOT AI solutions do not look like this way right so look some other okay yeah okay so let's summarize um, embedded systems network enabled constitute a core of the IoT and EndNode hardware infrastructure. Uh, efficient local computing devices like those Raspberry Pis, Nvidia, uh, Jetsons, Nano, uh, low power still act as a fog or edge class layer for the IoT ecosystem, mostly as a fog. Uh, so they implement routing, protocol translation, aggregation, all this network related stuff. But they're going to also measure something. Modern network infrastructure along with new protocols plays crucial role in IoT. <coughs> Cloud solutions delivering storage and computation services for the IoT data are an essential part of the IoT ecosystem. And the data and knowledge is crucial. So AI comes here, right? Like 